So I want to thank everybody for coming, um, for your attendance and your time. Uh, I know that there are plenty of talks here that you can attend, so I appreciate the fact that you've you know, expressed an interest by being here. Um, my name is Brendan Vanis. I am the head of developer success for PlayFab, which, as many of you know, was acquired by Microsoft in January of this year. Um, my own background is that I was a game developer for many years. I started out uh, working at Sierra Online, the venerable old house, back when Ken and Roberto ran the place. Um, I joined the ATG team, the Advanced Technology Group at Microsoft after that, to help game developers make their games and specifically to uh, be the principal technical outreach contact for Xbox Live and all things server and service related. Um, I went to Microsoft Studios briefly after that, but when PlayFab came along as a company, when they first started up, uh, they were looking for somebody to run developer relations and it needed to be somebody who was passionate about games, understood game technologies, and really wanted to help to level the playing field. Because that's what PlayFab was built for, was to provide everything on the back end that game developers need, and to do it in a way that would enable everybody to be able to make use of it. So I was all in on that, and I absolutely jumped at the chance. Um, the, the guiding principles for how this started is, is what you're seeing here, is that everything has been changing about games for years now, and it's, it's reached a point where it's, you know, every, it's plainly visible to everyone. We've got you know, a marketplace of like $100 billion worth of games being played across 2 billion players worldwide, and it just continues to grow. Um, this is actually, when you, when you look at uh, Microsoft in specific, because some people, I, I will freely say, some people have asked me, okay, but I'm, I'm worried Microsoft bought you guys, what does that mean to the business? Um, frankly, if you look at what Satya's been saying the last little while, and you look at Phil Spencer and, and Karim Chowdhury, it, the message is pretty uniform. And that's that the old Microsoft was, we're gonna pull you into our environment and then you're, you know, you're in, our, in our box and you're gonna have our products and you're in our environment. That's, that's done, that's done and dead. Um, the new model is we're gonna go to where the customers are and enable their experiences there. So um, we had the opportunity as part of the, uh, the, the acquisition, being really super open with you guys, because I feel like doing that here. Um, uh, to really evaluate where they were with all of this. And because of my past experience with the Xbox team, I knew Phil well, I knew Kareem well. Um, I was able to talk to them and feel them out about the subject and they are absolutely serious about that. So that's where we're going with this. Um, but, okay, so what's changed about games? So if you go back to like the 2000, 2001 era, there's only one game that made it from 2000 to 2001 in the top 10 grossing titles list, and that was The Sims. But if you flash forward to when the kids born that year went to college, uh, so the 2016-2017 era, 70% of the games, seven out of 10 of the games that were in 2016's top grossing list are in 2017. And uh, uniformly across all these titles, the, the, the common thread, the theme between them is they all use live game operations. These are all games that are taking in the data about how players are playing their games and using that to differentiate the experience, use your segmentation, to drive events, to do all kinds of things. But basically, when it comes down to it, fundamentally understanding how the players are playing the game so that they can tune it and drive it based upon that knowledge. Um, so a couple of quotes, just for, for quote's sake. You've got the, uh, the Space Ape COO where he's talking about the, uh, the revenue they've generated over three years, $80 million, and the fact that they feel that like anywhere from one third to two thirds of that can be directly attributed to their live ops plan. And then, of course, uh, Owen Mahoney, if you guys know him, the CEO of Nexon, um, single greatest predictor of success and sustainability in the business, in his words. But you don't have to take their word for it because we have data. So this represents two games that ran in PlayFab, or I should say run in PlayFab, since neither one of them has actually sunset their titles yet. Um, the, uh, the, the line that starts out high first, the kind of red-orange line there, that jumps up and then sawtooths its way down. I'm not gonna name that title, I'm not gonna name the developer. That, <laughs> that's a title that got featured on iOS and Android when it was launched. So that's why you see that giant jump in numbers. And we begged them to start using live ops because we examined their title and realized they weren't doing anything. They weren't really taking in any data for the game. They weren't using it in any way at all. And this is a developer who said, no, we know what we're doing. We've shipped that game. Now we're gonna move on to the next one. Because that's the old model. That's the old way of thinking. You ship a game. Maybe you do some content updates for it, but you're pretty much done. 
right? Um, the blue line, on the other hand, I will name. That's a company called Fluffy Fairy out of Germany. They made a game called Idle Miner Tycoon to start, and that's actually that, that line right there. Um, they've actually, the line goes well beyond that. It's actually been months since I did this chart. Um, but I had permission to show up to this much data at the time, so that's what I'm gonna show for now. What these guys did was they, uh, they, they, they were a dorm room company. I and mean, they're basically just a group of guys working out of the dorm and put together in eight weeks their initial version of their game and put it on iOS and Android. That's it, just eight weeks. And then what you see in that slow crawl there, which represents about two years, is they just iterated on the game. They just had fun with it, just iterating and playing and taking in user feedback and seeing what they wanted to do with it. And when they finally were like, you know what, we need to be serious, let's make this into a real business. And that's when they did some research and they talked to us and they, you know, about the live ops and, and figured out what all they wanted to do. And right there where you see that little down dip for a second and then the, the lines start taking off is when they turned on all of these things, whether it's events, push notifications, re-engagement campaigns, all of those things. And the line just continues to grow. They did a, they did a GDC talk with us uh, this last year where they called out the fact that they were making on the order of, I, I wanna say it was more than $100,000 a month. Might have been a week. <laughs> but the data is definitely there. If you go look at the GDC vault, you can find out how well they're done with this. Um, got a great office now in Germany. We've got a bunch of people on their team. They've grown it considerably. And they've launched another game, Idle Miner Factory. You know, have a look. They're simple games, but they are fun. And that, to me, is really the key, is, is live ops. This is about changes to the game after it goes live, like it says. Um, it's about making sure that you're able to retain your players best and give them the best experience so that you increase your monetization, yeah. But I, I want to be really clear about this. When, when I talk about uh, maximizing the monetization on your title, I am absolutely not talking about finding ways to squeeze money out of players. Because that's, that's a short-term play, and that's one of the worst things you can do. If what you're doing is you're focused utterly on, oh yeah, how do I get that guy to convert? And that's the only thing you're thinking about, then you're gonna push players away. Um, if you build experiences, time, time and time again, I've seen studies on this. If you build experiences that are fun, that give the players a lot of value in terms of gameplay, and you just give them ways to reward you for it, whether you're doing a premium game, which you know they pay up front, so I guess you're done, but for a free-to-play game, if you're giving them ways to, to reward you as a developer by buying things, whether they're costumes or whether they're actually in-game usable things, the players will reward you. Yeah, it's a small percentage of players, but as long as you don't limit the ways they can reward you, you're gonna find that some of them are gonna reward you a lot because that's what they enjoy. They know that they are funding the things that they enjoy. I make a point of going out of my way to buy you know, the, the DVDs of things I already have digital copies of. Right, I get the Kindle and the hardback and the paperback sometimes because I want to loan it out to people, right? And I'm not the only one like this. Um, so this is what we're talking about, is that the old model was games as a packaged good. Almost all the work was done up front before the game shipped live, right? Whereas you move into the modern age, games are now a service. Even your single player game is something where you want to track the data of how people are playing it so that you can you know, update your next game and make sure that you can do even better with that one. You know, focus on the things that people want out of, out of what you're building. Because you can, you can talk to your community. If you have forums, great, and that's a great place to get some information. But as you've probably seen, only about 10% of your players are actually gonna post anything in your forums. The majority of people tend to stay silent. But behavior, the, the actual way that they're playing a game, the way that they're interacting with it, is absolutely something you can track on. And obviously you wanna make sure you're doing that in ways that are safe. And I can talk a little bit about that in a, a moment. But that's what we built PlayFab around, was this concept of being able to uh, evaluate everything, right? Know everything that's going on with your game. Because it's, it's a lot of fundamental components. You've got you know, a, a catalog system and in-app purchases. You've got data systems, both for the player, for the title, for your, your clans. You've got uh, leaderboard systems. You've got automation around being able to take actions for players, you know, content, everything. Um, but all of that is built around a real-time event system. And the reason I'm going a little quickly here, a little more than I usually do when I'm doing a presentation, is because I want to take time for a demo as long as my internets behave. <laughs> so I'll show, show the sum of this to you in very concrete terms in a moment. Um, but hammering the point home. 
real-time data. That's what's critical, knowing how your players play, not just the one game, but across all your games, and deciding how you're going to act upon that information. These are the key things. And it's everything. It's not just the game play, but it's also where they're coming from, you know, how they've acquired the game. Uh, if you do any kind of in-game advertising, how they respond to it, whether they're clicking through, right? Everything in there. Uh, Cross-promotion. If you've, if you've got multiple games, you know, and you do, like, cross-game rewards, how many of your players are taking advantage of that? So get to level 10 in one game, and, you know, great. That gives you a reward in game B. Do they do it? So I'm going to talk a little bit here about the architecture overall of PlayFab. Um, and this is just sort of a peek behind the curtains. If you want to build out your own system, you know, take, take photos of this, because this is, this is specifically what we did. Um, we built out a main server application process. Uh, this is all in uh, a scalable, oh yeah, I'm sure it doesn't pass anybody by. Amazon EC2, right? That's the next question I always get. PlayFab was bought by Microsoft. Are you moving everything to Azure? No. We built it in Amazon EC2, uh, in AWS, because we were using all the tools in AWS. Um, are we building new features in Azure? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely are. Um, and we're going to be slowly but surely moving things over, mainly because we can get a better price, right? And we can pass that on to you guys. Um, but, oh, and, well, we also get more assurance when it comes to SLAs and things like that, when, when you're talking about an internal team, because I can walk down the hall and smack somebody upside the head. Um, but the number one priority for us is not to disrupt any of our existing titles because we have a couple thousand live titles in the service right now and a lot of users. So there cannot be anything that harms that. That's our, our you know, primary guiding principle. That and no breaking changes. So when you guys ship a game, any API calls that you're using of ours, any functionality will continue to work for as long as your game is in existence, period. That is a hard commitment of ours. The only way we would ever do anything that would change existing functionality is if there was a security problem. Knock on wood, if I don't have any, kind of. Um, that, that won't happen because it hasn't happened so far, and we've been very careful about that. Um, the, uh, the only time we make changes to functionality is actually if we're going to roll out new functionality. So we'll roll out a new service, which does something updated. The old service will be eventually deprecated, which means it will be removed over time from our API, public API set, and from the SDKs. But under the covers, it'll live on for as long as there's a single title calling it. So okay, uh, the whole main server application is what drives the majority of the API calls coming in. It's all behind a load balancer. The load balancer feeds out to uh, three availability zones in Amazon uh, to make ensure if we have uh, high reliability. Um, back, back, again, candidness. When we first started the company, when we were tiny, tiny independent, like our first year of business, we were only in one availability zone in Amazon, and we learned that lesson because that availability zone went down. So since then, three availability zones minimum, and therefore we've never had downtime effectively. Um, all of that is then connected into our data model, which is primarily built on uh, DynamoDB, as you see here. Uh, we use a number of different services. I won't go into the details on quite all of them. One of the key ones to look at here is the, yikes, the PlayStream events. This is why I prefer bottled water. <laughs> um, the main one to, here to look at is the PlayStream events. The PlayStream event uh, service there is where all of the events are generated and where they are consumed. And everything that you do when you're making API calls into PlayFab generates events. There's also a cloud script processor. So one of the, uh, the core pieces of functionality of PlayFab is uh, what we call cloud script. And all that is is it's arbitrary script that you write that lives in our service that you can call on behalf of your title. It's designed for relatively lightweight operations. So it's not for you know, the long running stuff you'd have a custom game server for. But you can use it for all kinds of things, particularly for casual games, like checking of score, validation, time since last played, uh, sending out a message if you beat somebody's score to let them know, ha ha, I beat your score to your friend. You know, all kinds of things like that. It's effectively a, uh, think of it as the expansion joint for PlayFab. So we have a lot of features built in, but for things that you want to do that are custom, you can throw it into a cloud script. And again, full scalability. The idea here being, regardless of how large your title grows, you're not going to have to worry about it, because it's all being handled by our auto-scaling. 
which also applies to game server hosting. So if you do have something really custom that you need to do and you need a custom game server for it, you could use our game server hosting. You don't have to. Our matchmaker works whether you're using ours or an external game server host. Um, if you use ours, this is also designed for auto scaling. You, what you do is you, uh, you let us know how many instances of your game can run in a server host machine and how many minimum you want to have run at any time. And we just make sure that minimum number is always met regardless of how many players are in your game and how many are in, in these, uh, these game sessions. There's actually a new form of server hosting we're introducing this quarter that I'll talk about in the later part of this talk when I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys the, a rundown on our roadmap for Q4 and all the work that we're doing. And then there's the game manager, which is the, uh, I'll be, which I'll be showing you shortly. It's the, uh, the portal system that's used for all of the work that you're going to do across your team in PlayFab, whether it's changes to the title configuration, managing your players, or you know, managing your title all up. Um, all of that's in there, and you see again the PlayStream feed. And that's because you can monitor and use the PlayStream feed in the game manager, whether for debugging or for working with your players. All the events are there. And finally, the PlayStream processor. Okay, so this is the, that heart of PlayFab right here. Um, this is effectively a, an auto scale system, excuse me, system built using Kinesis streams so that we can uh, create new streams con, you know, constantly whenever we have a uh, need for additional streams of data. It's, it's the, the uh, I hate this term, it's the serverless model. I hate the term serverless because obviously there's servers. But the whole concept of the serverless model is that you have a stream of data and upon the stream of data you have consumers. And these consumers have jobs to do. Right? So in the case of an online shopping site, the stream is all the information coming from the clicks the players, do, or player, <laughs> the shopper is doing on the site. And when they drop a shirt into their cart, in the old model, like a long time ago, websites were built such that it would actually make a call to a cart and put the thing in the cart and the cart would return. That doesn't happen anymore. It's, it's all down to the serverless model where they drop the cart into, into a stream, or excuse me, they drop the shirt into a stream. Or more accurately, they're dropping an event that says, let it be known that a shirt has been added to the cart because there's gonna be different things that are gonna happen based upon that. And only one of those is a cart process watching the stream to say, oh, there's a shirt added. Because there's gonna be other things down the stream that are processing on the behaviors. So if you've added the shirt, there might be other things that site wants to promote to you. And that could change at any time. There could be multiple competing processes that are competing for screen space. And they're gonna return likelihoods of you adding something else to the cart. And the one that wins in that competition is one that gets displayed to you, right? So same thing with, uh, with how we built out our play stream process is that it's basically just Kinesis stream, Kinesis stream, however many we need uh, for internal processes or for delivering things out to you guys. And when I say that, what I mean is you can get a stream of all the data for your game headed right to your own S3 bucket if you need it. Okay. So let me do the demo. Let me jump into that because I'm quite keen to get to that part. And you'll forgive the behind the scenes look of this, but I pull up. So this is a, uh, a demo game, Unicorn Battle. And if I pull up my browser window here, you're gonna see this is the game manager. And let me scroll up and go to, I opened a few tabs on this to save a little bit of time. This is the dashboard for any game in PlayFab. In this case, this is the dashboard for a demo game, so you're not gonna see a lot of data here. You know, fairly simple stuff. But it gives you a lot of the, the basic, you know, driving your game dashboard capabilities, including your, your key information about, you know, number of new users, ARPDAO, and then up at top, the, uh, the actual API calls, which you can, you can filter these down based upon any API call you're making, or you can filter it down based upon the responses. I don't think I have errors here, no. But, if there were errors, you could filter it on the errors so that you could say, oh, well, you know, how many am I getting of these lately? But let's go to the interesting part of this, the PlayStream monitor. Eh, I suppose it's all interesting, but the PlayStream monitor is what I'm really trying to show you here. This is where you're gonna see the, uh, it's, there's a world map that shows you like where people are logging in from around the world, but at the bottom of it then, I don't think I actually clicked, there we go. At the bottom of it below that is the actual PlayStream. Okay, so. It's just filling in based upon past history now, but let's go to our demo, all right. So if I log in right now, and I'm tethered 
as you know, I'm tethered to this thing, which gives me some interesting IP results. So let's see where it thinks I am. So I log in, and there we go. We get the entity login. <laughs> Dallas! Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, what I tend to find when I'm using these when I'm traveling is that I get pretty much random locations. Um, I've, we've been around to a few of the places around uh, uh, the last few days around Adelaide and Brisbane and Melbourne, and um, we've, we've been logging in in local places, and commonly you get the right place. I will say that the, uh, the geo information you get from this, oh, and let me, uh, let me pull up the event for you so that you can see all the data. That's what the event looks like. So it's got the actual you know, information about longitude, latitude, that's coming from the IP address. So it's a typical IP to geo lookup, right? And those databases, because IP address blocks get bought and sold all the time, they're largely accurate, but they're gonna have a little bit of iffiness once you get up into the high 90% range. Um, what we're doing for that in the uh, uh, first half of next year is we're gonna be enabling you to use the geo information on the device if it's available so that you can just go with that. As it is right now, if you're using one of our SDKs, you get a lot of information about the, uh, the actual login. Uh, I'm actually, yeah, this, this is just a, a simple PC app, so it's not showing, oops, it's not showing you everything that it could, because normally what you get is you get the device type, Android, iOS, et cetera. You get the OS version, a number of different things about the device. So you can use all that for your analytics. Okay, so let me click into my player account here. Oh, and actually, that was why I opened it up in a separate tab over here, was so that you could see it a little more quickly. Um, and what I've done is I've opened up the actual user segmentation for this player so that you can see what it looks like. So you can see the player's in a bunch of segments. Because the idea here is that you build out your segmentation and you want to identify all the different ways that a player plays your game. So it's this high experience points player one. Let's open that up. And Every way that the player can play the game is something you're going to break out into a separate segment. The player can obviously be in many segments at the same time, but the concept here is getting to what we call the segment of one. So you wanna have a rich enough user segmentation that anything you can change about the user experience is something that you can individualize based upon each person in the game. And then if you have enough different ways that you're tweaking and tuning things, you're really giving every person a fairly individualized experience. Okay, so this is the, that segment, the high experience points player group. You can see that what we've defined it as is it's a player who has greater than 2,990 experience points. Let's make it a little more complicated. Um, so I'm gonna say it's somebody who's got a lot of experience points but has also spent at least a dollar in the game because I know I have not. And we're gonna add to this another stat that the there we go. Experience points is greater than or equal to, let's say 10,000. Okay. So now when I save this, um, that's gonna mean I've changed the definition of the segment. The player you know, is now uh, only going to be in the segment if he's you know, significantly played your game and has spent money, or if he's really, really played a lot of your game. Okay. And by the way, when you, whenever you uh, enter or leave one of these segments, if you see this bottom part here, you can generate an action. Because again, that's, that's the concept of Playstream, is that you've got these events coming in. Every one of these events can generate actions. Those actions can also then generate events that are coming back into the system. So in this case, we've, all we've done is we we're sending a push notification to let them know that they've entered this group. Uh, but you could also increment a stat, send them an email, grant them some currency items, and again, there's Cloud Script. So you can take any custom action that you need to by just calling into CloudScript. And of course you can delete them and ban them if you really need to. Okay, so if I save that out, let's save that. There we go. So my player here, let's go over to statistics. Where's stats? There we go. So if I load up this player statistics, what you're gonna see is he's gonna have three, a little over 3,000 experience points, I believe, because I was just playing it earlier and I noticed his stats. Did I not click this? Hang on. There we go, okay. So yeah, 3590. So if I make this, oops. Now it's already true that I'm not in the high experience points player group because 
you know, I don't have over 10,000 and I've never spent any money, but I'm gonna make absolutely sure. So if I save this up to 2,900, I know for a fact I'm not in the high experience points player group. And by the way, any change that you make here in this game manager is also then generating events back into the system. And the idea here, since you can see all of the, the, the various things that are part of the player profile, whether it's the, the main overview, the statistics the player has, the, you know, their logins, their data, all of this is here because the intent is that you'll be able to use this game manager as your primary way for interacting with your customers. And if you have a customer service group, whether it's you know, actually having your own internal folks or having a uh, third party team that you're contracting out to, one of the key things here is that uh, everything in this game manager is built around a role model. So you can create a role for your customer service reps, which gives them access to all this player goodness, but gives them absolutely zero access to anything else. Revenue information, game configuration, all of that sort of thing. So they can't do things that you don't want them to. Okay, so I've changed his stats, and if I go to his user segmentation, the user segments is now going to show that he's not in that high experience points player group, as he should not be, because he doesn't, he had, you know, doesn't have enough experience points and has never spent money. There we go. No high experience points player group. Um, so one of the reasons I'm doing that, uh, it's my account, and even if I play a game right now, I'm not going to get enough experience points, but here. So this is my in-game store, profile store. And it's got one item that's on sale, but then the other three are at the normal price. Uh, the reason I'm pulling this up is because I'm going to show you really quickly one thing you can do. So here is the store system. So if I scroll down, here's the profile store right here. So this is the one that has all of that, that information. You can see over here on the right, the health potion 1,000, crystal key 300, etc. All right, so if I duplicate that store, What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the newly duplicated store and I'm going to make something custom out of it. Once it actually loads. There we go. Come on. The hazards of doing a live demo. I hope I'm getting cred just for even taking this task on. <laughs> These bits are traveling all the way to Oregon. All right. Profile store. So let's make this the profile store for GCAP. Oops, if I can spell, there we go. And uh, GCAP sale. All right, uh, and I'm gonna give it a, some custom price reset. Reset, there we go. Um, what discount do we wanna give these guys? Just anything at all, what, what discount do you wanna apply? Anyone. 99. 99? <laughs> That'll be interesting. Let's see what it actually does. Cause it's, I'm not sure if it rounds up or down. 16, three. Let's see, five, where the, oh yeah, and one for the large pile of gold. All right, so 99%, there you go. All right, let's save that. Save. <laughs> Extremely generous, yeah. You love these players. All right, so now I'm gonna go to my original profile store. So the, what's happening is when the game is requesting the profile store, it's, it's getting this one because it's asking for the profile store by this ID, profile store. There you go. Um, but you can override the store that gets returned based upon the player segment. So if I override, where's my, there's my high experience points players. I'm gonna override that to the GCAP store. And this is a priority ordered list. So if I yank that up top, and I'm gonna make my active form users use my gold store. There we go. So the first one of these that is true for your player is the one that's gonna be used. But it's the first one that actually has an override. So if I take the, let's move the all players all the way up top. So all players isn't gonna do anything because it's not an override. It just does nothing. So it's a pass through. So the first and most important thing is if the player's in the high experience wins player group, give them the GCAP store. If they're a forum user, active forum user, give them the gold store. But otherwise there's no override. So let's save that out. Now you know that my player is not in the high experience points player group because you can see he's not, but he is in that active form user group. So when I go here, close this door and reopen it, I'm gonna get the gold store. How about that? All right, so yeah, gold store. And then if I go ahead and play the game some more, and I'm not gonna make you guys sit through that, I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna change the statistics manually. Uh. 
basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the statistics. Ugh, God, if I can speak, if I can change these statistics now such that his experience points is over 10,000, obviously that's then going to make him in the high experience points player group, and then he'll get that store instead. And I know you believe me, but I got to prove it. <laughs> Come on, what's going on? There we go. Save. It generates an event, and the moment that has cleared my screen, it will have been completed. Actually, I can pull this up while it's doing that. Where's my mouse? There we go. Open up the store and we get the GCAP store. There we go. Because the idea is everything about this is you're doing things based upon what the player's doing in the immediate. One second turnaround is the goal here. You should always be, you know, sending up an event and immediately taking an action on it, immediately making a change to that player's experience. Maybe it's that if the player is being beaten by a boss over and over again, he loses five times in a row, maybe you make the boss easier. Or maybe you give him a one-time opportunity to buy some health potions in the store or a bigger sword or something like that. But these are like just the crudest changes possible. I mean, the, the whole idea here is, and this has been a, a theme for me in most of my career, is that I want to enable the most flexible tools possible because I want to see what you guys are going to do with it. I want to see the kinds of creative expressions that come out of this community of developers based upon having this kind of you know, open way to interact with your players, to engage with them in ways that you know, maybe previously you didn't have the opportunity to do. And in specific, more than anything else, I mean, it's, it's enabling everyone to do this um, at a level that makes it possible for everyone. Because previously, the only companies that really had the ability to do this were the kings and zingas of the world. And frankly, this is something where um, everyone should have this capability in their games. Everyone should have the ability to customize the player experience and to, to be able to take advantage of the data because otherwise you're at a disadvantage, frankly. Um, and that's just... That's where, that's where you get more and more of the same old, same old in the games industry. Only by enabling everybody with these kinds of capabilities are we going to see the kinds of creative things that come out of the companies that are here, the company, you know, basically the, the smaller companies more than anything else, I, I guess I'll put it that way. Although I want to see that going up into the bigger companies. I want to see things like uh, Dream Daddy proving to the big companies that those models are absolutely the ways that they can be successful in the future. Okay. So soapbox moment over, sorry about that. I get kind of head up about this. Now a number of the, the next slides here are really here, just they were here, <laughs> they were here as my backup in case my, uh, my wireless here didn't work at all. So just really quickly to recap and kind of the concepts that you were seeing there with the, with the demo is that it's all about using the data, right? And being able to take the events that come in. Um, I showed you one example of the event. That's, that's our, our, our event history screen where you can do uh, exploration of events, you can do grouping on events to try to see, you know, uh, how many of your users are iOS users versus Android users, you know, as a, as a simple sort of check. Um, the in-game manager event history is, uh, uh, it, it's up to 30 days, depends upon the, the tier of service you're in, basically, uh, and it's stored in elastic, ca uh, excuse me, elastic search caches so that you can get really quick results out of it. All history for all time for your game, though, is being stored off in our data warehouse. And I'll talk about that in the uh, what's coming. Uh, the, the top, obviously, from what you saw earlier, that's an example of one of our built-in events. I didn't show you the full list, but, I mean, effectively, every single thing you can do in PlayFab generates an event. I think the only thing that, that doesn't have an explicit event is just updating the, the data, like raw data for a player or the title. And that's simply because you can't write all of the data out to the event because it'd just be too big. But everything else, uh, from logins to in-app purchases to statistic changes, multiplayer game sessions, all of those things automatically generate events. And you can also generate your own custom events. That's what the bottom part represents, is you can generate custom events that also have their own custom parameters. And whether they're the built-in events or the custom events, all of it can be used in Playstream as part of your user segmentation or part of your rule system. It's something that I didn't explicitly show you, but we have built in um, an A-B experimentation system so that you can divide up your users into bucketized groups and then test out different concepts on them. Maybe just different interface colors, you know, as simple as that. But all the way out to and including, uh, if you're doing a, uh, a premium game, uh, one thing you might want to do is vary the, uh, the demo components. Because you might have the demo be 
you know, level two, second section, or you might have it be level three, section one. Do an A-B test on that. Try different people at different levels and see what kind of results that you get. Um, the rules engine is something where you can take any event that's coming into the service. In this case, it's the statistic changed. That's one of our built-in events. So in the conditions, every parameter that's part of any of our built-in events are already built into the conditions. You can use them out of the box. For custom events, you just fill in the conditions if you want to use them. And again, all the actions are available to you. So you can set up rules that fire any time an event comes in or any time an event with certain parameters comes in. And you can also build scheduled tasks into the service as well. A scheduled task is something where uh, it either runs once or it can run on a schedule uh, where the actions that it's going to run are gonna run either at the title level, which is really handy for doing events currently. Um, talk more about that in a sec. But you could set it up such that you change title data, you change the stores that are available based upon you know the Halloween event is starting. And then again, when the Halloween event is ending, you change them back. Uh, or you can run these against a segment of users, such as in this example. Um, this runs against all active players. So you've got a segment defined, which is everybody who's played the game within the last, I don't know, 24 hours. Maybe that's how you're defining active players. And this would walk across every single one of them and send that push notification out to them to say, hey, this new event is starting. Um, you could also use this, because uh, this is a this is a manual one time. You could set this up to be a recurring, where you're running it, say, once every hour, and what you do is you define a rolling one hour window. People who have not played my game for three, uh, three days, people who have not played my game for three days, one hour space. So it's basically greater than three days, but less than three days plus an hour. One hour rolling window, you're targeting then your group of players who might lapse, but you're also targeting then the time of day that they play normally, or at least the last time they did. Set that up to be a recurring task, run every hour, and every hour it'll take all those users, send them out the message, and it could be your action could be send them a push message to say, we miss you, come back, and hey, here's some free gold to spend in our game, because that's the other action you throw in, is grant them some virtual currency. So when you think about this, and when you think about the, uh, the actual analytics and how you want to drive that, basically it's, you want to have a rich set of events. Everything that the player can do that you want to track on, that you want to be able to understand and differentiate has to be in there. Um, and realistically, you want this to be coming through a semi-structured data ingestion system. Uh, what that means is you want to be able to throw any new event at it in simple JSON, which is what we use, or if you build your own, maybe XML is your preference. But you want to send it out in this simple uh, semi-structured format without having to do schematization. So the death of your event system is gonna be if you have to have a, a barrier between your, your designers being able to get new events into the system and just having them there. So if they have to do a schema, that slows things down, it prevents them from doing things. For quite frequently, it means they have to get an engineer to set up a new event for them. Don't, don't, don't go with that. Go with something where you can ingest, ingest any data and have it automatically be indexed. There we go. And this is just another example of the way that the, uh, the play stream works. I'm not gonna spend any real time on this because you've already seen it. But the idea is that, yeah, the events flow in. They're run through the rules engine. They can be sent out to our third party integrations. Uh, they can actually be sent out to your own services through a webhook if you wanna run your own as well. Uh, the events that those generate can then also flow back into the system and everything goes out to the data warehouse for your own use. And more of the uh, the backup slide here for in case things didn't work out. Full dashboard use, uh, the ability to get your own reporting out of it. Uh, we have built-in reports for all of the fundamentals from uh, uh, your retention numbers all the way through to your, uh, your spend by your players. Uh, all the things that are fundamentals, the ARP DAOs, et cetera, uh, those are built-in reports in the service that you can use. And we're also gonna be doing a, uh, a custom reporting system in the near future as well. Um, but the, uh, the PlayFab service itself is completely platform agnostic. Uh, so we run on anything. And there you go, there's another question I get as of the Microsoft acquisition. Will PlayFab continue to be available for all platforms? And yeah, the, I mean, the answer is yes, it absolutely will. Like I was saying earlier, the idea is we're going to where the users are, not trying to pull them to us. So PlayFab is a partner of, uh, 
Sony for the PlayStation Network. We're a partner of Nintendo for the Switch. We're a partner for Apple and Google, all of them. One of the things I used to say was that if your if your refrigerator could make an SSL call, it can use PlayFab. I've switched that though because a friend of mine wrote some uh, an application. His Tesla sends API calls to PlayFab, and so he has a monitoring dashboard for his Tesla. Um, we've got over 2,000 titles, over 100 million monthly active users right now. Um, we've got developers of every size. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's I don't I don't really differentiate based upon who they are. I differentiate some based upon the, you know, the total MAU that they've got because, let's be honest, you know, the, the, the larger impact titles are the ones that are getting more users and the ones that are, are, are basically improving people's lives more is the way I look at it. So those are the ones that are going to be getting a little bit more attention, obviously. But at the same time, I don't want anybody to feel like they're left out if they've got a small title. All the capabilities of PlayFeb are there for you, regardless. We even have a, a free tier if you want to just set up your title and light up the dashboard to have a look at what the capabilities are, you know, without having to, to risk spending any money on it. Um, the capabilities in the free tier are relatively low. They don't give you a lot of the live ops capabilities, but it's there so that you can at least get a sampling of it and see how it works. And, you know, if you want to build your own, hey, you know, knock yourself out. You can certainly examine what we've done. Um, so roadmap, and that should read Q4. My own bad. <laughs> Um, so here's what we're doing for Q4 for PlayFab. This is give you a little insight into, into our thinking. Um, I will say that there's a blog post on our site. So it's, this is, you know, uh, the text of what you're about to see is not going to be any great secret. However, if you ask me questions about it, I can certainly answer things that probably aren't going to be available on the site. And I'll try to give a little bit more tech context here as well. Um, we're doing a new server hosting system. Like I said, the new systems we're bringing online are in Azure. So this is an Azure system. Uh, but part of the reason we're doing that is because it gives us more capabilities uh, in addition to lower pricing. Because we, the server hosting is, is uh, charged as just a pass through. We don't design this around revenue. It's just simply whatever it costs us is we're, we're passing on to you guys. Uh, but this gives us more region availability. It gives us 30 regions as opposed to the dozen or so we had in, in AWS. Uh, the, reason, the reason for the limit on region availability was simply because of commonality of server types. So we needed there to be a certain number of, you know, the, the, whether it's the M4s, the C4s, the R4s, the T2s, et cetera. All, we have to have a rich set of servers available and not all of their endpoints have that. So yeah, 30 regions, we're gonna have Linux and Windows. We're actually gonna be giving you, it's not on here, but we're gonna be giving you the ability to remote into your servers now that we're gonna be in Azure, which is great for being able to debug. Um, this is a system, system that's currently being used in a number of live titles right now, including the, the latest Rainbow Six game. So it's definitely uh, very, very battle tested. Um, the scaling in this system is a little bit different from what we've done before. You still tell us um, how many servers can run on a machine and you tell us how many servers you want to have minimum. But in the old model, that minimum needed to be basically enough to support your max number of players. In the newer model, you're gonna be able to keep that a little lower. And the reason for that is because we're doing dynamic scaling based upon advanced knowledge of what your title is doing. And what I mean by that is that that kind of traffic pattern that you see there is pretty typical of online games that use multiplayer servers. You're gonna have some regionality to your game, which means you're gonna have kind of that sine wave-like curve to your, your usage. And what the new system is doing is it's using that information to start pre-scaling before the uptick on the curve. So just before it occurs is when you'll start getting more servers online. There's a new matchmaker. The new matchmaker we're working on is uh, basically the new version of the Halo matchmaker, effectively. Um, when Xbox Live first got rolling with matchmaking, they had a fairly simple queue-based matchmaker. Uh, no AAA title used it. They all wrote their own because they wanted a tighter control over the matchmaking experience. The Bungie guys, uh, now obviously called 343, back then they were still called Bungie because Bungie's separate. Um, they developed one that was kind of considered the gold standard at the time, and they did a whole article you can find if you do some searches. I think, I think it was on Gama Sutra, but I actually didn't look it up before this, so I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but they did an article all about their matchmaker and how it works. Uh, and basically, it, the idea here, if I, let me skip over to my next slide. The idea here is it's all about uh, balancing your quality of your match versus the time it takes to get into the match. So... You're gonna have factors, you know, the skill level of the player, regionality, you might wanna mostly group them with friends. 
Uh, you might want to have like a clan system and mostly have them play with their clan members. There's all kinds of factors you could put into this. But what you want to do is you say, okay, here's the ideal match, and then here's where I'm willing to flex the match, you know, flex the, the reasonable range of what I'm looking for, whether it's skill range, etc. So if the player doesn't find a match within a few seconds, you start expanding those ranges until you finally find a match for the player. Uh, there's a new commerce model we're adding in. This is actually the work that we did for Minecraft. Um, and when I say we, I don't mean Playfab. Um, Playfab is now, uh, it, when we were bought, we were about 18 people. We're now over 120. Uh, and that's because Microsoft merged in two other teams that were looking at and building backend technologies. One of whom was building out technology exclusively for the Microsoft Studios teams. And now they're doing it exclusively for Playfab. So all the work that they do from now forward will be benefiting all titles. And one of those things was this commerce system they built for, for Minecraft. Uh, it's actually, it's an extremely rich, very flexible content system, uh, commerce and content system that has uh, better performance than our existing one, but also it has a more complete trading model. So all kinds of uh, trade systems that you want to build in will be possible. The really, yeah, the, the UGC thing is on here, but it doesn't really do it justice. Um, the amazing part of this is that they built in this UGC system, which if you've tried the UGC in, in, in Minecraft, excuse me, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Basically, it's, it's a complete user-generated content service, so people can create the content and they can post it and others can discover it, they can rate it, uh, they can report off offensive or infringing content, and you have moderation and takedown. You know, all those things that you need out of UGC. But the, the thing that blows my mind is that they managed to get in a... Uh, a real money model. Your players, if you want to build this in, can charge money for their content. So if you have cases like, if you look back at the old uh, Forza racing games and some of the, the car designs that people did, some of those people sold on eBay for real money because they were amazing, just beautiful. So you could have that built into your game where a player could simply create this beautiful, great content, which other people want to use in your game, and then charge some, you know, charge 99 cents for a level that they build, and that then becomes uh, revenue that the player gets. It's a rev share. You, you, obviously, you'll have flexibility in determining how much rev share you want to do with your players. But they actually managed to build that in, which absolutely surprised me. So, delighted me, but I was surprised. Um, the new data warehousing model uh, is based upon some work that we've been doing with the, uh, the data teams at Microsoft. So, the the amazing thing about being part of this company now is that uh, it gives us access to resources we never would have had access to before. The research team, the AI team, the machine learning team, and in this case, the data team, the data sciences group. Um, they have a uh, data pipeline model that's going to replace our existing one, which is going to provide us with uh, not, not just the things that we already have. It's going to give us the ability to expose the data to you in ways that we couldn't before. If you go online and you look at the Azure site and you search on uh, the Azure Data Explorer. It's in preview mode right now. Uh, it's basically, it's a large data system that will give you open query access into your data. That's what we're going to be exposing through PlayFab is that system. All your data in the Azure Data Explorer. Um, oh, and it's also gonna give us the ability to ingest at a far higher rate. So currently all events coming into PlayFab are flowing through that PlayStream model I showed you earlier where everything that comes in is being processed. So we examine every event, use it for actions, use it for the rule system, use it for user segmentation. Uh, in the newer model, we're gonna still have that, but there will be a, a, another stream of data. So you'll be able to send up a far higher rate event system where those are not being processed in PlayStream, but they're being ingested for your own analytics. So a number of, of shooter games, for example, use that for every time a bullet is shot, they're making a recording of that event. So you'll be able to do uh, batch events up to us in very high volume using this. Um, part of the change to the new data systems means that we're gonna be able to give you new KPIs and dashboards as well. Um, there's a lot that I can, I can say about this. Um, what I'm gonna to skip to is some, one of the things that we're gonna be enabling first, which is giving you funnel analytics. So what you'll do is you'll define the events within your game that define the different steps of the funnel. You know, started, uh, started my tutorial, completed stage one of the tutorial, killed the first boss, got the first achievement, whatever those things are, you'll be able to define the steps and we'll do automated reporting on that for you. And then the next step past that, and this goes back to what I was saying about having access to the machine learning team, is we're working with them on ways to then 
uh, identify outliers in the data and also examine commonalities. So if you see a, a drop-off in your, uh, your funnel analytics, we're going to be, uh, one of our, our goals for the next year is we're going to be building in ways to highlight to you commonalities for the other events for those changes. So we'll be able to hopefully highlight to you the, the reasons for why you're seeing a fall off at some point in your, in your funnel overall. And if you look at the, uh, the dashboards right now, you'll see that the, uh, the, these things are being exposed already. These are things that just went in within the, last, within the last week. That one, the bottom one, actually went in just a couple of days ago. Um, and it's giving you some rolling uh, KPI information about things going on with your title, like your recent MAU, your day seven retention, your revenue. Um, the bottom one is showing you benchmark analysis. And that's over there on the far left side of it. What benchmark analysis is, this is the latest thing we've rolled into it, is basically what we're taking is you're self-identifying information about your title. I'm a match three game. I'm a racing game. I'm an RPG. And we're going to give you a, a benchmark analysis of how your title is doing versus other titles in the marketplace. Uh, we've got new leaderboards coming as well. Um, this is actually, if you look at our forums, we're very, very active on our forums, by the way, in getting people information. Um, one of the things that you'll see is a number of people asking about uh, bucketization, basically. Because being in position 256,812 is really not meaningful to a player. Being in position 36 out of 100, that's meaningful. So one of the things that we're working on right now is giving you the ability to group players into bucketed leaderboards so that you can have that experience for your players. There's other changes that are coming as well. There's going to be a lot more data available to you to store as part of any particular statistic. Uh, right now, you can back, get back the whole profile. The profile contains all the player statistics, location, all kinds of things. Um, and by the way, that's, it's only the things that you allow to be returned. That's all configurable in the service because we don't want things returned that you wouldn't want exposed. Um, but you can use that to build rich leaderboards right now. As of this quarter, you'll be able to act, add the, uh, the metadata as well as part of what you're showing. Uh, there's a persistent connection we're going to be providing to you. This is an optional connection where you'll be able to say, while the player is online and playing your game, you're able to push things down to the client. So PlayFab up to this point is a web API-based service, REST-like calls. That means that up to now, you've always had to pull for things. So there's a message of the day system in our service, for example. Um, when the player comes online, you can request all the recent messages. But if you, you know, you know you always publish your messages at noon, maybe you've got in your client code, yeah, well, if it's noon, check anyway, right? Just another recheck. You won't have to do that anymore. Um, when you post new, a new news item, you'll be able to say, oh, if somebody's online, just push this data down to them. So arbitrary data push. Um, configuration management is around controlling the, uh, the dev test live flow of your game. Uh, what you're going to be able to do is take a snapshot of your game, which is all of the configuration information, all of your title data, your stores, you know, all of the fundamental things that you put together that are the, the definition of your game on the service. Snapshot that, and then you can just paste that onto another title to make a, a very clean dev test live flow. It will also enable you to make a snapshot, make a change to your game, and then if you realize your change has screwed up your game, roll back to that snapshot. Uh, is anybody here an Unreal developer? Oh, fantastic. Um, so if you guys have looked at us at all, uh, our Unreal uh, SDK does not incorporate the online subsystem yet. And we know that's a shortcoming on our part. We are taking steps to change that. So this quarter we are rolling out uh, a new version of the SDK in the marketplace, in the Unreal marketplace, that will be fully integrated with the online subsystem. So I realize that for some of you guys that's kind of a, a deal killer if it's not there, so I just want to make sure you're aware. Um, we're integrating with uh, OpenID Connect. And effectively, what all, all this means is we're giving you the option to use any OIDC-enabled service as an authentication source for logging players in. You can log in players using device IDs, uh, your own custom IDs, you know, Google, uh, let's see, Apple Game Center, Twitch, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and the list goes on. Um, this one is about being able to take just a generic OIDC provider. So if you have your own or uh, if you want to use like Discord, because Discord uses OIDC, you'll be able to use that as the auth system for your game. And we're working on localization. And what this is specific is, uh, specifically about is localization of the game manager itself 
our tutorials and you know the, the fundamental things that, that uh, we have in Playfab for game developers. There is localization coming to Playfab for the games. If you create a title in the service right now and you look at the email template system, because that rule in there about sending emails to users, it uses a template system. So what you're doing is whenever you're sending an email through one of those actions, you're saying send an email using this template. And then the templates can have like insert player name, right? So you can say, hi, Joe, thanks for playing the game. Um, the uh, email template system today has the ability for you to specify a different template for every conceivable language. And you'll see what I mean if you pull it up. The list of languages is every language on earth that's a live language, a living language. Um, so we're going to be uh, making that, in, going into the first half of next year, we're going to be making that change to the rest of the strings available for your game as well. All right. I appreciate you guys sticking with me up to this point because I know I'm the only thing between you and the evening beer. So the call to action. Okay. Um, go ahead and create an account. Uh, we have a free tier. We don't mind anybody using it. There is no limit on the number of users. You could have a title with millions of users in our free tier, and that's fine. We've had titles with millions of users in our free tier. Um, but mostly what we want you to do is start using it just as a base so that you can start looking at the way that things work in the service, getting an idea of how you might want to use it, figuring out what things you want to track about your users and how you want to you know, make your changes to your game such that it feels like a more of a living entity to your players, right? How you want to do your actions, how you do want to do your events. Um, and you know, I'm going to skip to that last one. More than anything else, I would love to get your feedback because a lot of the best ideas about you know, the things that we do, the things that we have, do come from our community. And bubbling up the ideas that are coming from our community and making sure that those become prioritized tasks within my team, that's, my, that's part of my job. That's one of my favorite parts of my job because I get to go and fight for developers in the, the prioritization meetings. But two, there's also a live ops guide. I actually, I actually have one here. Um, there's a guidebook that you can download as a PDF off our site. Uh, and this contains a bunch of best practice information about live ops. Again, whether you use PlayFab or not, this is valuable information for you because it's just, these are, these are the best practices assembled by discussions we've had with dozens of development companies that are doing these kinds of things right now in the wild. So I highly recommend grabbing that as well. Okay. A little bit all over the place, but yeah, I wanted to just open it up to questions, so go for it. Yeah. And um, there is um, one thing that either I don't know how to do it or I wish we were there. And if, it's, if it's wish you were there, my answer is just one? Um, <laughs> Go for it. Um, so in the collection, mm -hmm. I want to set up a collection and, you know, I've got a bunch of drop tables. Are yeah, drop tables. So you're in your catalog and you're looking at drop tables. Drop tables, for those who don't know, are the random result tables. So there's a lot of different ways you can set up things in the catalog. Drop table is just give me one of this set of things by these weights. Basically, if I want to have a, you know, a, a, loop, a loop. Yeah, a loot drop, yeah. A loot drop, and I want to have five items, and I'll have a drop table for each of the items. Currently, it seems like I can only have one item for a drop table. What if I want to be able to say, all right, for this drop table, give me 40. For this drop table, give me 50 of those same ones. Can I yeah, the, the way you would do that um, is, do, do I need to stop now? Is that what you're taking me? Um, if you can take questions outside. Okay, um, let me finish answering this one and then we'll take any other questions outside. So yes, you can do that. The drop table is designed, give me one item. It's basically, you could put in like 20 different items with different weights. The drop table is, give me one of these items. What you do is you define either a bundle, which is an inventory item that comes with other things, and you'd have a, the drop table be part of that. Drop tables can reference drop tables too, so this can be a tree of decision making. Yikes. Um, or you'd make a container. A container is an inventory item that contains things. You only get what's in it when you open it, and it can have a, another item, which is the key. So you have to have the key to open the container. Anyway, those both can reference drop tables, and what you do is you'd put in a drop table, and you'd say 40 of this drop table. That's exactly how you do it, yeah. Yeah, bundles and containers are the way to use drop tables. Yeah. All right, so I guess we're getting kicked out, so I'll take any other questions outside. <laughs>